Bam, we're live. <clears throat> that was easy. Thanks for having me. Dude. Crazy. Thanks for reaching out. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Yes, yes, yes. I think the last time I was reminiscing over the last time we had chatted and uh, it was pre, um, ga- uh, pre-Masters pre competition. You were doing some stuff in the check-in area. and That uh, was in Carson, correct? In Los Angeles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, you were just hanging there doing some doing some of your stuff there prior to the competition. And prior to that, gosh, was uh like 2010. So that was like four years between. Yeah. <laughs> what what state are you in right now? Arizona. Did you um oh Brian? Good morning. Hi. Brian, James, James, Brian. Do you guys know each other? Have you guys met? Uh, I'm sorry if we did, Brian. I don't recognize your face. I didn't have a beard last time we met. I came out to um, your place there in Scottsdale in probably 2017 for CCP Level 1 seminar or something like that. Okay. Um, uh, James, what is um, – do, do you have an Instagram handle that you like to promote at all? And I'm going to put it down here in your name. No. Uh, the OPEX one or anything? OPEXfit.com is – is good or the opex fitness handle. opex fitness <laughs> so james um in um well, i don't know what year it was but i but i but i was on instagram and i met brian on instagram and i invited him to um to come on the to do a podcast with me about the games and he came on and i quickly realized that he's an opex guy and that i had invited the enemy into the camp and i was like what the fuck yeah what does that mean what have i what have i what does an opec guy mean and he's just he's a fucking he's he's did your he did your uh what's it called this the cc ccp ccp he loved it he was he's one of the best trainers that i've ever met he was fucking up all he was just ruining my narrative just ruining my narrative about the enemy he was a good guy he was knowledgeable i was like what have i done here (laughs) and ever since then we're just two dudes who met on instagram and uh he's helped you know, help give me some clarity and unfuck me a little bit. Oh, that's good. Yeah. They, uh, he had me out to um, Santa Cruz there, and we did a podcast. But he wasn't actually there. He had. <laughs> he had, he had been, I ran, invited him, and then left with Greg. And the guy who does the back end for the podcast, he's like, "Oh, we should put up your Instagram." And he pulls it up, and it's like OPEX, OPEX, OPEX. He's like, "Yeah, I don't think we're gonna put that up there on the CrossFit podcast." <laughs> I was like, "Whatever." And I'm speaking obviously in in some really gross uh, hyperbole because I've n- I've never actually thought anything bad about OPEX. There was just a, a, a curse shuffle between, um, I guess OPEX and CrossFit, and so that I was just kind of like joking around, like I was towing the company line. But I've always been extremely uh, impressed, isn't the right word? But like you said, we saw each other at the games. You and I have something. A connection that I don't think anything, at least for me, nothing can interfere with. I, I, I have no. my, my strong opinions about you um, that can't be changed really or, or, or weren't changed by anything anyone said to me because I've had a, a honest, high integrity, high level interactions with you. Yeah, you saw the, you saw the inner workings of the home. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm impressed with you. Hey, so you impressed. Stayed, uh, you stayed like uh, you slept like 30 feet from me, below me. Or, so that, scary. So so I was in the I was in the shower this morning and I'm and I'm in the the podcast always starts before the guest comes on. Like I hear the whole thing start up. I do your part too, by the way. When I'm in the shower, I do my part and your part. And and I started reminiscing. Did was I? Did that basement flood that I was sleeping in while I was sleeping in, and an alarm went off and kept us up all night? I was like, am I making yeah. this shit up? No, 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 not at all. Um, it was. It's on an acreage, so it was just like a. Uh, it's not it's not a basement it was like a crawl space and uh it has just has some sensors down there relative to the moisture we were getting and yeah they went off when you were here (laughs) (laughs) oh man that was a brutal night you guys slept in the house for a couple of days i think because you had some other things you wanted to do as well uh but it allowed you to be on the acreage and and hang out and do your do your thing did you still own that do you still own that place yeah, we still own it. Ironically, we're just uh, speaking to the to the family that's in there right now, and uh, they're loving it. We just rented out to them, and they love the they love the land and taking care of it. So, and what's up with the gym on the property? Is that still functional? 
<laughs> no, well, he's turned it into a man cave um, with the, the huge TV and the sitting area. And yeah, so he's really enjoying it. And during COVID times, he had an opportunity to, to have uh, some of his friends over because of the, the size of the place. Um, anyways, it was, it was a positive, positive change away from the gym. And, and, and now you live in Arizona? Yeah, Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah. And you're also, do you have a place in Coeur d'Alene, I heard? Yeah, yeah. We go there for the summer because it's quite warm down here in the desert um, during the summer months. Beyond warm, right? Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's uh, I think I actually said this to your face before. If you remember after the, uh, <laughs> the deadlift burpee uh, workout at the 2000 eight games um it was that mat the wrestling mat they had down <laughs> yeah yes yes it was, like, it was like unsafe hot arizona yes. is unsafe hot in the summer times yeah yeah uh, people he's not that's no um hyperbole that oh, it is yeah. actually there's nobody outside I've, I've spent a bunch of summers there um not like the whole summer but a week here a week there and there's actually like no one out it's like a ghost town yeah yeah you yeah go wow you go from, you live in AC, basically. AC in your car, AC in your home, AC in the business, AC in the store, AC everywhere. And, and why did you move there? What was the motivation? Really the lifestyle, uh, meaning, you know, sunshine, um, lots of sun all year, um, high activity level. Um, and it was just an opportunity. So as an opportunity arose, as the businesses started to change shape in Canada, uh, we just took it. You know, because we had traveled south of the border numerous times and really enjoyed the uh, the warm weather and the activity with our girls. And you'll never go back to Canada now uh, the United States is your home? Not at all. Uh, we're green collar holders, just to clarify now, in case uh, this is a digital footprint. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're green card holders uh, and we're on our path to citizenship. Yeah. So uh, we're not going back. Um, anything is possible now. This morning, I saw an article that said Stevie Wonder isn't really blind, and there were, and they showed video evidence of like him doing shit that showed that he wasn't blind. And it was uh, wow. I was like, wow, this we really do live in a world where anything is possible. Stevie Wonder is not blind. I mean, I don't know if it's true, but I mean, the article said it, and then the, the video evidence to me was quite compelling. <laughs> not not that I really care if he is or he isn't. I almost feel sorry for him if he isn't blind because that's. That's a, man. He wore sunglasses indoors a lot, and that sucks. <laughs> uh, so the tie-in there was the sunshine. Uh, just anything. We'll call the, you going back to Canada. Just anything oh. is po anything is possible. Like, oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, I, I'll, I'll stretch intense. out and grab anything I can, James. Hey, that just, was an intense carryover. Yes, I'll grab anything I can. I'll grab anything I can. I'm like a guy falling into a pit, just grabbing branches on the way down, falling out of a tree. Well, that's our job as friends is to uh, grab on to the stuff you're just throwing away as you fall down. Um, I You stopped Instagram on uh, – let me cheat with my note. November. November 20th, I think, 2020, or let's just say November 2020. Why did, why did you stop? I, it's impossible. I can't research you on your Instagram since you stopped. <laughs> Please start up again. Speaking of things that are not real, um, well, you know, if, it's, if I'm not on there, you know, no one knows what I'm up to. Um, I used to track my workouts, uh, on Instagram and, uh, I just took a good reflection, uh, over a period of time. I was a late adopter to, let's just group them all together, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Yeah. Anyway, you started in 2016. Most of the people I have on started like at 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So I was a late adopter to it. And, uh, so I just took a little bit of time to reflect upon why I was using it and, or why I was there. And, uh, for me, it just, uh, held, it didn't hold much value, you know, for continuing, uh, being, being there, reflecting on a couple of things. Uh, I have two young girls that are coming up in this, this new world. And, uh, that's something to just keep in the back of my mind in terms of, you know, my intentions about, you know, how I'm, how I'm out there and what social is for my intentions and how that's reflected to my children. Um, I recognize that my business was, uh, very successful without me and our success points are a little different probably than than people think they are but uh, you know having coaches in ccp is our is our big thing that's our thing and uh and i didn't have any influence um of that connection to those points 
you can probably track the lines to see it, but not neither. And I, uh, I was tracking my workouts and, you know, it, uh, I just saw that I could start rewiring my brain around tracking my workouts because they were important to me and not necessarily to anyone else. And, uh, so I just started tracking them on pen and paper again, <laughs> like I used to for numerous years and, and then when you just look back into those those things, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, that was really what was offering me an opportunity to do that. And then I didn't need to do it anymore. So, yeah, just didn't. Well, I can um, <clears throat> respect, totally respect that. But I will also let you know that I found a tremendous value in the in the workouts that you posted, the consistency that you posted them, and the um, and I think especially what you were really good at, probably still are really good at, is just the demonstration of what I think Ben Bergeron said is a low trajectory to a distant horizon. So like my perspective of you as an exerciser is a guy who, you know, um, you, you're, you're active every day, but you're never doing something that's so debilitating any day that you can't do all the other things you want to do. And I think that a lot of people are falling into that trap. I see a lot of people fall into that trap often. So it was a good, it was good, it was refreshing for me to always come across your page and see like, man, this guy just went for an hour kayak today, or he did this little 12 minute AMRAP. He was able to move through high skill movements the whole time. But the only reason he was able to do that is because he's got 20 years of consistent exercise under his belt. Well, that's good. Thank you for the comment. I think, uh, maybe then that that's a, just a reflection of uh it uh it doesn't have to continue so i don't have to continue uh to be that person you know people can people can go and search it um and you you can find that kind of information or you can find that that form of knowledge and i'm glad that you did find it or whatever that was that you pulled from it but i would argue that i don't i don't i don't think i need to continue to do that to wake people up to you know the principles that were inside of my own journey for fitness if that makes sense Definitely. what did you what did you mean the fact that you have daughters now and in in that in your relationship to quitting can you explain that to me like objectify that a little bit for me yeah for sure well you know the Tristan harris uh, i followed him in his work uh many years ago and he was uh just an individual who was inside of the the tech group in the west coast and uh what was my first connection to him? I think he had spoken to Sam Harris prior to uh, his like movement out of the tech industry, let's say. And, uh, and he was talking about things in terms of, um, and of course, uh, uh, iGen, which is uh, uh, Twenge's book, as well as Jonathan Haidt's research on this whole difference in 2009, 10, 11, 12 in, uh, in individuals, you know, creating an identity and as well as this new understanding as to what social cohesion is and where the, how they are part of society. Uh, I started to just see this, you know, unfold in myself, you know, unfolding in things that uh, I just felt that I was, you know, a part. I just felt uh, dirty <laughs> and there's no other word to describe it. Like I was part of, I was part of the whole movement of attention and attention platforms and attention seeking platforms for, again, on the back end in my reflection for, for no real value for why I did those things. And at the same time, as I mentioned, Tristan Harris's work, as well as Jonathan Haidt's research, um, of seeing the, just the younger group of individuals growing up with that and i have two young girls 15 and 12 you know they're growing up in that in that area in that timeline where a uh, a, a form and a, and a development of reality um is significantly shifted so i have to play a role as a parent as because i'm that's my responsibility to uh you know to partner with them to see this new reality and this new so social perspective, but to also be there to answer questions on what is real and what is not real, and also give them education on how they're influenced and how influence turns into coercion and power. 
and to give them the knowledge of that. So that's what I mean by me reflecting on that particular thing and then looking at my children at the same time saying, you know, where do I want to fit in that if I want to explain it, you know, discuss it and give them this concept of, you know, growing up in this, let's call it virtual slash somewhat real world. Um, I think, uh, I think I, you know, I think I had to do that if that makes sense. Um, there, there's a bunch there. Um, so, so social media, using social media as a, for, um, to get attention for the sake of getting attention instead of, instead of doing something for the sake of whatever the other reason is forward progress. And, and, and that, and then you bring up a really interesting thing, which is a favorite topic of mine on all 209 episodes I've done. Um, what is real and what is not real. And that, that's a fascinating subject, uh, that I try to embark on, uh, regularly with people that I just, um, the weird part is, is that people conflate their thoughts with reality and the shit's all just, just so twisted up it, just for the sake here to give just a simple example, like red doesn't really mean stop. It's just something we agreed upon. And it's important to remember that and green doesn't really mean go and we we agree upon these definitions and these rules so that we don't get in car accidents is that what you mean like by discussing with your kids what's real and what's not like even yeah for sure or ideas aren't real they're just ideas yeah or at least you know <clears throat> i think even bringing up the language of reality and real whether i you know whether i can really truly explain it efficiently um that's that's another interesting point but <laughs> right right you know like <laughs> the but, endless quest yeah you know but um yeah let, let's let's use an example of you know i won't i won't move away from it if the, if that's the area that you want to stay on but no 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 this goes anywhere you want okay the fitness the fitness relationship please right? so coach and client relationship so you know uh the person sitting on a Peloton bike on the 37th floor in Manhattan, uh, the, the person that's on the other side of that screen, mm -hmm. that's not a relationship. So that's not a real relationship. If I define what a fitness relationship is. Okay. And I'll use that as like a, you know, a lane that I'm in that I can use as a base support or, or let's call it a template, a heuristic to help teach my kids, you know, what, what is a, what is a real relationship? You know what a real relationship is, is, uh, you know, the things around the security that they feel when I see them at the end of the day, my girls, you know, and I get to hug them, right? Like that's, there's a visceral component to it and there's a bunch of other things, right? And that's, that, and, then, and then there's like levels of relationships outside of that. But my whole point being is that I'm, I'm trying to find the right language, you know, I may not be able to land on what real is. And I understand the philo philosophers who, or at least I understand their, their dilemmas that they have in the conversation of reality. I really appreciate that. Um, Me I too. Think, I don't think I'm mature enough yet or have had enough experience actually to get to the, to the deeper aspects of, you know, consequentialism, util utilitarianism, effective altruism, et cetera, that is tied into those kind of things. Besides the fact, um, I want to... I want them to at least be strong enough to recognize uh, what real might mean. If that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So, yep. And then, and then maybe when they're, when they're 48, <laughs> they could, they could tiptoe into like, you know, well, what is real, <laughs> you know, and ask that, ask that hard question. <laughs> uh, the, the Peloton thing is interesting. Do you own a Peloton bike? No. Have you ever done that? Uh, no, no. Does it intrigue you at all? Uh, I think the, I think the, the phenomenon of it, you know, um, I think the marketing of it, um, I think the, uh, the concept of the idea, I, I just find the whole thing fascinating, you know? Right. So that's what, I, that's what's intriguing is as like an outside observer looking in, seeing it as, you know, it's just like, I see Peloton as like the carnivore diet, you know, the carnivore diet is a, is like the seventh iteration since 1980 of, uh, of basically a low carb version, right? And so you swing it any way, it's all the fucking same thing. But no one can actually make that statement unless you've been a part of all the iterations of the carnivore diet. 
Mm. So you can see my lens of Peloton is horseshit. It's fucking folly. It's a new version of this 1985 version of spike uh, cycling classes. Mm, right. I got, I got, uh, so two things. One is, um, you know, you, I remember when I went out there to see you, the, one of the first things you said is, uh, you know, none of this stuff that I'm t telling you guys is new. It's a, oh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants is what you said. And I like, I've always really respected that about you is that you look, um, you know, backwards and you want to learn from the people that came before and then apply it in this new world. And I hear you talking about that right, right now. The other thing about that Peloton, I, <laughs> everyone who, t who tells me they do Peloton, they're always like, man, I'm in the top 5% and I just want to get in that top 3%. And when we're thinking about reality, I'm just thinking to myself, man, whoever's running these computers is doing something on the back end to make everyone think that they're in the top 5%. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little like a CrossFit movement. <laughs> I, 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 um, I, I'm, I'm definitely intrigued by it. I've never done it. I don't know if I ever will do it. If I saw one, I'm very curious, at least bare minimum on the superficial level. I'm curious to see the action on the bike, how it feels like. I really enjoy riding the bike. I spent a ton of time on the assault bike. So just, and I used it before I had kids, I used to spend a ton of time just like riding bikes around my neighborhood and just every day. So the biking thing is fun. And, and you know, what's interesting about that relationship thing. We don't, I'd be curious if you want to talk about this, we can, but it's, it's, it's two totally different relationships. So the relationship I have with my wife, we're basically in very similar relationships. We're both mates, but in that Peloton relationship, the person riding the bike and the person like on the other end on that 37th floor of that building, it's the, I guess, um, and I'm not trying to argue with you here at all, just for the sake of semantics, but there is a relationship. It's just totally not the same relationship. It's, um, yeah, I think it shouldn't be called a relationship. That's my point. And that's okay. Why okay. Call it a real relationship. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cause then you get into semantics of like, well, it's right. Like, um, so I mean, we have a relationship with you can think about it as like a fitness relationship of someone in person right? Uh -huh. The people that you have in your gym, right? The, the person that the person that you actually see their brain transform right in front of you, because they learn how to do a certain movement and pick up on some skills, right? Right. And then they pick up on things like, wow, you have not only taught me how to do a dumbbell press, I can actually connect that to how you've given me a gift of autonomy that's long term down the road, right? So that kind of stuff can't happen online. Because you know why? That person doesn't need to show up for that Peloton class, and that trainer doesn't give a shit about them. That's the definition of a real relationship, where when it's broken, that coach goes, Jesus, like, what's going on? What happened? How come you're not here? Or how come we're not continuing this, like, discussion around learning? And so there's there's a number of things inside of that that it's a, it's a, hijacked, it's a hijacked concept um of of reality really they're like oh no this is a real relationship you could see all the marketing for it right right they're, right. they're basically reaching through the screen and and like hugging them you know essentially in the in the video in the marketing and uh the commercials which i find again just fascinating as to how people can be coerced uh based upon that because they're just pulling on their emotions right and uh but anyways it's not a relationship it's not a real relationship <clears throat> You just described the entire world we live in. Uh, uh, James, wh what did you mean by um, it, it's, it reminds you of CrossFit and the whiteboard? I, I can't, I'm not making that leap. Give me that. Oh, uh, we connected it to, uh, oh, it makes everyone believe that they're, that they're the winner of the top 5%. Yeah, that's what CrossFit made everyone think with the whiteboard, right? You're no, just, ex ex explain, there's sorry. Standards, there's these standards, you know, and we're going to put it up on the whiteboard and there's this uh, thing to shoot for. And we're going to applaud and uh, show off James Fitzgerald and OPC ah, right, and yeah. uh, the, the elite of the elite. And that's right. going to be our marketing toy. You could one day, too, be this if you do this 2159, which is just like they're doing. We'll just somehow change up what's inside of it. But you're still, you know, going towards that. So I see it as the exact same thing. I wow, think that Seven was confused because he's never been in the top five on the whiteboard. No. <laughs> no. at my house i whoop some ass on my four-year-old and six-year-old uh well, well to keep going on that one too i always thought i was in the top five percent when i was online right yeah but, uh come to know over many many years down the road there's a number of people who were not posting who were far better than what i was yeah that 
And see, that's another concept of reality, right? My reality right. was I was the best in the world, like every day, right? Right. But eight years down the road, it's like, no, dude, you're like a thousandth out of all those people participating. You just posted. So that that now that's that's so that was that real for me? Well, it was at the time. <laughs> I, th I think what you, I think that that that's like um, for each individual to deal with. Right. I mean, yeah. you could the best free throw shooter in the world might not be in the NBA. Right. The greatest five dudes who ever played basketball may have like never, you know, stepped on the court. Yeah, it's content. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so so in, in 2000, um, early 2006, I, I met a guy I, w I was working on a show for um, ESPN. There was a bouncer there. He worked <laughs> out. He told me he did CrossFit. He described it to me. I go, this is bullshit. No one does this kind of stuff. I ended up going online and looking at it with my friend, Kerry Peterson. We're like, holy shit, there really are workouts that where people do a hundred pull-ups. What the fuck is wrong with these people? We started trying them. And that is how I first came across um, James Fitzgerald. He went by the um, moniker OPT and there was James and there was uh, at the time that I showed up on the scene, there was James, there was Chris Spieler, there was uh, A AFT, uh, there was a lady, uh, uh, Kelly Moore, Kelly Moore, yeah, and and a handful of other people. But definitely at the top of the food chain was um, James. Then in 2007, they had um, uh, what they call I don't even know if it was called the CrossFit Games then, but um, they, they had the event in Aromas, and I um, at that point I had already started filming with. For CrossFit, it was before I was getting paid, and I asked Greg, "Hey, should I come out to this event at Aromas?" And he said, "No, it's point. It's 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 kind of pointless." That was a huge mistake on my on my part. I should have just came out there. Um, and uh, at that point, James, um, the guy you're looking at on the screen, and a an amazing lady in her own right, uh, Jolie Gentry, um, both won that event. And then uh, flash forward a year to 2008 as, as the, the second annual event of this kind. By then it was called the CrossFit Games for sure. And that's how I met James. I went up to um, north of what we call the United States into this country called Canada and um, got stopped in customs. And I was accused of bringing steroids across the border. <laughs> He may have been asked to. <laughs> um, uh, it, was, it was crazy, too, because there was some sort of oil conference going on in your town. And just all the dudes in three-piece suits just rolling through customs like it was nothing. And here, Carrie and I, poor Carrie was shaking. They found broccoli in his bag. And the late, these two ladies start yelling at him. He had a Ziploc bag full of almonds and broccoli, and they started yelling at him. Do you not take our customs serious? Didn't we not ask you if you have food? I was like, holy shit. He's going to get the rubber glove anal probe him. get him. So, so, and that's uh, just to put it in context. And that's how I um, met James. And, um, and then we made the movie every second counts um, for uh, $17,000 that year. I was so proud of that. It was, it was, it was really, um, and that featured James and Dutch Lowy and John Wellborn and Josh Everett. Um, uh, Matt Mursky. Matt Mursky, um, all these people opened their homes up. Uh, um, they were all just so amazing. Um, and then, you know, that was that's a pretty intimate experience when you ask people to let them come into your home with your cameras. Uh, James, you just had a baby then, right? You had a baby at the house. Yeah, Hannah. Hannah was then um, a year and a half old, almost two, and Chloe was, and Leanne was pregnant. And, and how old were you then in 2008? Uh, 34. Yeah, that's nuts. So James had two kids and he had this beautiful home and then he had this insane gym that was, I don't know, 50 yards from his house, 50 feet from his house. Yeah. And um, and I was still living at home with my mom. I too was, I, I, I too, I was probably, I don't know, maybe I'd moved out by then. I was probably, was I 30? How old are you, James? I'm 49. I'm 48. Okay. So, oh, so I was, I, uh, I just moved out of my mom's house. I was 35. So I was a little, little slower, blossomed a little slower than James. Um, and then, and then James, so, so, so the, I, I just, I don't know what happened after that. Mm. Um, between us, between you and me. No, no, no. Everything's good between, I know what happened. We just didn't <sighs> communicate. I, I, I don't even have your phone number, which is so weird. I went to just text you and I didn't even have your phone number, which I thought, do you have the same phone numbers you did back then? Oh gosh, no. Oh, Okay. 
<laughs> so even if I did have your phone, and you don't even have this, you don't have the same email or any of that. Uh, no, it may, it may find its way over, but uh, no. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so you, the, you win the games in 2007 yeah. and, um, and at that time you're running a CrossFit gym on the property. Um, no, at that time, I think we had moved into the, or maybe we were finishing up on classes there and we were getting ready for the purchase of, uh, um, the location down in Crowfoot. Okay. That sounds yeah. familiar. Yeah. And, and then from there, um, the only, I think I've seen, I saw you at for sure at the games. I definitely run into your brother a handful of times. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I have, uh, I always get excited when I see you. I think I've gone out of my way to make sure that I see you. Um, and, and then what happened? So when, when did you start your own, your own, I don't know what to call it. Your own, your own training pro. Is, is it, I, I, I'm, I know what I know what I want to call it. I just don't want to call it anything that's that's wrong. So oh. one, your own training program, your own lifestyle methodology. Yeah. Um, well, I had begun that in the mid '90s um, prior to leaving uh, Memorial uh, University in Newfoundland, and then I moved to Calgary in late '98, and um, you know started working then. So I guess it was the late '90s when that started. Um, did you was, have a name for it? Yeah. Optimum performance training. It was, okay. Even back then. Yeah. That's where OPT came from. I remember, uh, when I met Leanne, that was one of the first things we did was, uh, to register my business. Um, yeah, it takes a woman to do that. Like someone who's like, got some, like, I mean, I could have a whole podcast unto itself for, I know. For, for those things would you even own a house if it wasn't for her does she do all that it, stuff like your first house I, like does she sign the paperwork and like do all the adult shit oh this is funny we discuss this all the time i would i don't know <laughs> i don't i can't do any of the adult stuff my wife does all that right you know the tra trajectory of a human right um and then you look at you can ask the question what would be the continuum of the opposite end of that continuum that's where i would be <laughs> if it wasn't for leanne so that awesome. explains all of it right there. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'd done that in the late 90s. Um, I had started that to answer your question. I've been doing, uh, I was doing the, you know, for those of you who've been around the strength conditioning industry for a while, I was reading, you know, Iron Mind and uh, Muscle and Fitness and uh, the the first internet versions of uh, of uh, Dan, uh, Dan Duchesne's uh, um, body opus and uh, the underground, you know, militia bodybuilding groups and uh, the old uh, muscle media, 2000 forums. I, I was in that crew, you know, um, in the, in the mid to late nineties when the internet was just starting to like uh, come online and, you know, you'd, you'd wait for maybe 15 minutes for the, the newest article to come out from these people who were, giants and in, in strength conditioning you know writing different things and then us going trying it out you know so i i had i had been in in that quote unquote area and then was you know as a uh, technician or someone who's just getting out of the university area just practicing these things you know on people day to day and myself and then when i went to calgary it became more real because it's like okay i'm i'm done with school now i want to put the work you know in for I don't know, paying for a roof over my head and developing a, a future, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, I was just always super curious. I think that's what it been a, I guess, a success point for me. I, I loved, as you know, um, uh, you know, explaining to you my story of how I fell in love with fitness. It just makes sense, right? You know, I was down and out and then I got you know, a fitness, a, so me. a soccer injury, right? You, you had yeah. a passion for soccer and there was a soccer injury that turned you to yeah. fitness. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And then, you know, you, you see this new birth of a person, you know, a, a mind and a body. And, um, yeah, so I just wanted to practice that. And, uh, I, I think I got success from that, that curiosity of like trying to figure things out and see where fitness fits in. And, um, it's been a, it's been a great process, but to answer your question, um, Prior to CrossFit, I had, uh, you know, which was like late 2004, I think, when I started doing it online or my friend introduced me to it, the concept. Um, 
you know, I thought I had all the answers already, you know, for strength conditioning and, and et cetera. But uh, I, I tipped my toe inside a CrossFit because I thought there was something magical inside there for, uh, for a new definition of work. Um, and uh, um, I just saw decades of work uh, in the future being dedicated to, you know, you know, how do you eloquently put together a bunch of modalities at one time and, and, uh, and get that outcome? So I just saw a whole bunch of work inside that. Anyways, um, sorry to be lengthy. I'm, I'm reminiscing just not at all. Reminisce away. Who was your friend who introduced you, James? Yeah. His name is Jason Lomond. He was, uh, uh, he, we, we, uh, graduated together out of, uh, uh, university Memorial and, uh, he went into, uh, uh, the therapy route, occupational therapy, I believe. And, um, and, uh, at the time he was doing that and starting up his life, uh, we were still, uh, talking online and going back and forth with different kinds of training programs. And I was helping him, he was helping me and, uh, he was doing some fighting. And so I was uh, mixed martial arts and, uh, I was at the time really interested in that, the preparation for it, et cetera. And he went to a camp, I think. And, um, anyways, from that camp, he came back, he was like, Fitzy, these guys from California are like maniacs they're doing this thing called crossfit <laughs> you should check it out and because we're just like fiends for anything within strength and conditioning you know it's like okay we'll check this out and get online and so the story goes you know um but uh yeah so up at that point in time and then to the, you know I, i've been training for i was training for a couple of years prior to the games so it uh, as i said it makes sense that i show up and i'm you know you know, one of the top people there, you know, cause I've been like digging in every day, you know, three 30 AM wake up and just try to beat everyone who's on the leaderboard uh, for a number of years. And, uh, and then, you know, I was, I was, uh, I had, I had good capacity, you know, it's with, with mainly simple stuff and uh, good absolute strength. And so if, if any of those things showed up at the, at any competition, I was going to do okay. And so obviously that's what came up and, you know, over two days, three events just suits me. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, we met and, and preparing for 2008. Yeah, et cetera. I could go on and on, but I'm not sure if that's what you wanted to get. I, I do want you to go on and on. I want to ask some questions real quick or, or make an observation. So it's interesting. Um, the, the completely, uh, I guess, egocentric, selfish, narcissistic, person that I am my perspective is that you came into CrossFit and then broke away and then you hear the story and you hear no it's nothing like that at all it's two roads came two roads were parallel they came together and then now they're parallel <laughs> and they just touch each other and they just share information it's amazing for like so from my per because I, I see the world from my own eyes right so you're already in the fitness space for fucking your whole life. And, and, and I'm an idiot for not knowing that because I already knew that you had this deep passion for soccer mm -hmm. and then you get and then you obviously and you pursued every, um, you know, piece of information and you were curious and you were just building your, your mental, physical, emotional library of fitness and health knowledge. And then, um, obviously the, that fitness space is all in one bucket. So you just had interaction with it. It's, it's, it, but I was projecting onto you, my, my thing, I have no fucking exercise experience at all, zero. And I just came into CrossFit. Like I was the fat kid in high school who, you know what I mean? Like got picked after yeah. the girls when they picked teams in high school, all the boys would get picked and some girls and then, Oh, look, Sevon's over there. Um, turned out okay. Yeah. It turned, it was good. It was good. It was good. It made and it by, so that I had to be funny. Yeah. And, and you know, by the way, without knowing anything about either of you guys, fast forward to this 2017, 2018 period. And I have this, uh, interaction with, with CrossFit. And then I have this interaction with OPEX, both of which were like, you know, from my perspective, unplanned, they just kind of happened organically. And then the, the, <laughs> when Sahar invited me out there, it was like this so so strange in my mind that there would be any tension between the two entities, knowing nothing about either one of them or how they ever had had that kind of brief interaction and going their own ways, maybe. And I thought that they were both, like personally for me, they were both um, providing me with something that created a greater person in me as far as a coach, an athlete, and just an overall healthy human. Makes yeah. total sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, well, you know, the fitness world is fucking weird, um, to be honest. It's, it's, it's we, uh, we could take the word fitness out of that statement, by the way. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, we could sit with that one for, for a while. Um, 
Yeah, so it it, sh it should make sense, right? All of it should make sense with conversation. It makes sense, um, but it should make sense that it's it's perceived. Uh, there's perceived tension. It should make sense, right? If I if I'm if I'm experienced, quote unquote, and not to signal at all, you know, the kind of things that I knew prior to my entrance into CrossFit. But if I had spent uh, close to 14 years, you know, uh, working day in, day out on the concept of developing systems for strength and conditioning and fitness and et cetera, I should know something, right? So that should, that should hold some weight. So when I come into the room, you know, it should make sense if I'm perceived differently and if it works for the whole story that uh, it's a, it's an en enemy look, you know, that probably makes everything better, you know, for the whole, for the whole storyline. I mean, I didn't come up with the enemy route or the, or the, you know, the, the opposite. Um, I, I obviously have, I don't even, I don't even know how to count the ways and the differing of opinion, you know, uh, with regards to the methodology and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it should make sense to us that there was perceived to your point, so on that, you know, you, uh, you said you projected this concept on it, but it should make sense that we thought that because that's the way everyone wanted it to be. You know, we got to have enemies. There's got to be a, there's got to be some competition. There's got to be dissent. There's got to be, you know, controversy. There's got to be drama. And that's what, that's what keeps a lot of the shit rolling. It's I a, even tell, I even tell the story now. To, to you, I share it to you with more drama than there actually was for the sake, yeah. for the same reason that you're saying. It's right. I mean, what you're saying is just so spot on because really in my mind, all it was is, oh my God, there's James. But I, but I also knew the outside narrative a little bit. I really didn't pay attention to it. Like I couldn't tell you where the drama came from or what any of the salient points are, but I did know that like, okay, there's some beef between Greg and James or some beef between James and Dave. And so like, I was aware of that just on the most superficial level. James must have taken Dave's girlfriend from him and the eighth grade and you know what i mean i mean yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just it, it was as real as that to me no i think it was uh i think i'll speak about on our group i mean mm -hmm. you know we, we probably tiptoed into making it seem like it's more than what it was also i mean that's just hey <laughs> that's just uh fighting the fight and being a part right. of the system and uh and uh if it if it uh if it you know raises voices and gets the crowd excited, <laughs> let's talk about it. You know, if it saves lives, fuck it. <laughs> and I mean that. Yeah, especially no, young mean, lives. Yeah, for sure. If it, uh, but if it, if it also makes people uh, think more critically, I'm also a fan of that. You know, so um, and that, that's what I think I may have offered is for people to just uh, slow down and take a second. Just take a second now to think about that. And uh, there is that consistent message on your Instagram, by the way, too. To 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 um, push to support people who think critically, to introduce people to think critically, yeah. to reward people to think critically, and to yeah, slap the shit out of those people who don't. Maybe slap them awake a little. Yeah, bit. <laughs> I, I would love, I would love to take on a whole new avatar and criticize bad ideas. I probably have twenty years of work that I could do based upon that but um it's just uh making those decisions like where do you want to put your energy and uh i've dedicated to putting my energy towards the uh, uh the forward progress of uh coaches and uh the value of coaches and that's where i'm going to put my energy because it makes me uh, sleep good did you did you ever um sorry sorry brian did you ever before um, somewhere in there go back a little bit um was it when you got out of college, the timeline, uh, was there a time where you were, had to get a job like um, at, at McDonald's or at Starbucks or like putting up sheetrock? What did you do in between college and like becoming um, OPEX? Like, yeah, I, I know that's a, kind of a big question, but what did you do? Yeah, no, did? no. Well, it was it was really the Mc, I, I call it the horror to the <laughs> fitness industry. Uh, but, you know, you, I did the quasi McDonald's jobs times five when I first moved to Calgary. So I had finished uh, uh, some honors, uh, an honors dissertation and some research, some lab research, which uh, luckily enough was published with uh, one of my mentors, Dr. David Bain, and then catapulted that to a, a certification process in Canada, which kind of like labeled me as like, you know, a trainer that would know their shit. And then I did the uh, 
NSCA's version of the time of like the, oh, you must really know your shit now. I did that certification and then uh, moved west and then came out there with let's call it a big brain and an and a, and a empty pocket and uh, and started, you know, in multiple different areas. There was a, a Gold's concept style gym up in the northeast. I had to take a um, a train to that uh, um I didn't pay for for half the time because uh, I didn't know, by the way, in case anyone in Calgary is going to be coming back to get me on that. But um, <clears throat> you used to get on a train to work and you thought the train was free. I, and then after like six months, you're like, why are all these listen, people with their tickets? Listen, just think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like I started CrossFit. I didn't know you're supposed to time your workouts for like six months. I was like, oh, this but is I went back cool. and reflected on this. And I was like, you know, I, I'm just going to claim the uh, stupid, you know, young kid, naive kid from Northern Labrador. Right. Like I. Honestly, I went from, if anyone understands Newfoundland and Labrador, like it's, <laughs> it's not modern, you know? So the, the concept of coming into Calgary, which your three-piece suit and oil says it all, it's a very, aff at the time, a very affluent, tens of thousands of people moving there per year, a shit ton of money because of oil. Um, anyways, that's what I fell into, right? You know, so, so when I went there, uh, Savon, I, I worked all kinds of jobs. I did some private consulting at, at, uh, at uh, fit systems i did some uh under under the table uh personal training at the at the current point which was the talisman center i did i did personal training um, uh, at a health club i did some ymca ywca um volunteer and training stuff so yeah i did it all i did all that stuff to kind of you know just to make some money and pay for my uh pay for my Rode the train free that and, and, and that's get some personal that, training. That yes. One one room apartment. Actually, it had a bathroom with a door, but then the entire other area, um, downtown Calgary, was a was a one bedroom. And and when did you meet your wife? Uh, ninety nine, uh, the uh, fall. <clears throat> excuse me, the fall of ninety nine at a YMCA conference, because I had from the period of time that I just mentioned to you in Calgary. I had gotten the job with uh, Imperial Oil as their fitness and fitness oh. and style director or something. Wow! And uh, it was a uh, really good pay and like you know the the echelon of like the jobs for like a professional fitness and lifestyle consultant. But I fucking hated it. It was it was horrible. It was like sitting at a desk and people coming in like, no, nah, I don't need your help. I'm just doing my 30 minutes of cardio so I can go back to my desk and make a shit ton of money uh, for this company. Um, and uh, then a, a YMCA opportunity in Crowfoot came up. <laughs> what was called the strength and conditioning director. It was half the salary, but I knew that the opportunities inside the YMCA in Canada is really big uh, for education and uh, education inside the, the organization and the growth, et cetera. Anyways, long story short, I went, then went to the YMCA. I kept all those private jobs, went to the YMCA, was full-time there and then met Leanne at a leadership conference. She um, worked for the YMCA also? She worked for the YMCA in Edmonton, which is a city that's north of Calgary. And um, uh, we went, met in the Western Western YMCA leadership conference or something. And, you know, it's just a, it's just a basically a, an opportunity for, for people to get together and have fun. And, and we had fun. Did you want to get married? I'm trying to think back right away at the time. I don't know if I wanted to get married or if I just wanted her forever. So I don't know if you. Right. I think, I, well, if you want to call that marriage, then that, that would be it. Right. But when, when I met her, I wanted her and I didn't want anyone else. I wanted her forever. <laughs> did, did you, did you know that, um, like, is it like how, so you were in 99, that was uh, 20 years ago. So you were yeah. 28 or 29. Did you at that point think that you would ever get married and have kids like as a, as a young man? I didn't think about those things at the time. Um, but I knew I wanted her. Um, right. And I knew I wanted uh, her with me on this thing going forward. And so, and then I think we just took the, the classical steps then next of uh, being together for a while and uh, got a home, got a dog, got a second home, kept the dog and then, uh, and then got married and then 
went to Aspen Drive where you saw, started developing the family. Yeah, and so the story goes. We got married in uh, June of 05. And did you want kids? Yes. Well, right after the, the uh, let's call it the coming together, the first couple of years, um, we would talk about it often. Um, of like, you know, setting things up and when it comes time and et cetera. And then uh, post-marriage, yeah, it was like, let's do this as, you know, as, as, uh, as frequent as possible as we could handle. And then we kind of just landed on uh, two children and uh, we've been, we've been having a good time. When you say do this as often as possible, you mean just try to make babies? <laughs> try to make babies. Yeah, that's yeah. a good thing. Let's get to it. Let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's have children. And so, yeah, I think, uh, the family concept was, was, uh, and I'm, 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 I appreciate the questions cause I'm reflecting a little bit too, which I'm just appreciative of. And I'll just try to explain to you that I didn't think about these questions at those times, you know, I didn't reflect on those things. And so, um, it was just something that I think, you know, it's, if that makes sense, like in hindsight, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it was the, it was, that's exactly what I wanted to do, but I don't want to say, I don't want to say that's what I was thinking about at the time. It's just that, um, now that it's happened though, I'm so fucking happy that that, right. that was the trajectory. Do you know what I'm saying? K- kind of, I kind of do. I'm, I'm tripping on it. Cause I got, I'm, 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 I, I yeah, you're making, asking, I'm making a presupposition that I haven't gotten to yet. I haven't okay, told yeah, you yeah. why I'm asking all these yet. Oh, okay. So anyways, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop it after this, but no, go. Me, like, what, what did I, what was I thinking about for kids in 2004, uh, you know, a year prior to getting married to Leanne? I was like, yeah, she's, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I guess is what we'll do. Do you know what I'm saying? But now that we're on this side of it, it's like, oh yeah, I was like, that's all we, we couldn't stop talking about it. You know, we're going to have these children and this many times, you know, it's like, oh. Yeah. So that's why I made point of it. Uh, you, you were never in the mindset of like, you were never in the mindset of like, Hey, I'm never going to get married and I'm never going to have kids. That wasn't you. No, no, no. Um, and I think that just could be me. Like, you know, that's just, yeah, that just could be me. And it could be, you know, my upbringing, you know, I saw, um, my parents, I don't know. I just grew up with that. So yeah. Are your parents married, James? My Mom passed away a couple of years ago. My dad is still alive. They were yeah. married. They were married for um, whew, uh, 40, 40 something years. What What did your mom pass away from? Anything in particular? Uh, glioblastoma, brain cancer. And do do you, do we know what causes that? We do not. Um. And you probably got to dig into the storyline prior to that happening um, in order to answer that question, you know, fully. Uh, But I don't know if anyone out here has, you know, a parent or someone died from that. They would nod their head as well. It's fairly complex. The median life uh, survival after is like one to one and a half years. Um, it's, it's, a, it's fairly debilitating and there's not a lot of hope inside of it. So obviously there's lots of stories of families trying to figure these things out when it does happen. And the stories that are inside are phenomenal. You know, my, uh, my mom's story, as an example, we bring it back to a, or my sister brought it back to a traumatic moment that she had where, you know, I just, you know, it could be long, but I'll just show you, give you an example, right? Like things just come out of left field and we'll never know if it was like it was it was planted and all of a sudden it just grew as etc but uh she was parked behind this big uh truck and the truck was backing up and my mom knew that uh my mom knew that the truck didn't see her it was this big like 18 wheeler right and the loud noise going off and etc and my, my mom was honking the horn and they and they couldn't see her uh, well, they could see her, but she didn't think they could see her. And that moment, you know, uh, my sister said from that moment further from there, she had 
extreme headaches. She had anxiety attacks, had to be go to the oh, hospital, wow. medicated, et cetera. You see what I'm saying? So those, you know, did, th did those moments, did that moment was the, what broke the camel's back, I wow. guess, today, or did it, did it ra raise some things that, but, but as I said, when you listen to the stories of all the people that have been affected by this, you start to recognize there's, there's definitely one particular seminal moment that causes, that causes a major, a major issue. And, you know, it could be a number of different points, but it's complex and it's, uh, it's really, it's unfortunate. Yeah, that, but that's still awesome that you have that story, that depth, that uh, data point, if nothing else, even if you don't draw a conclusion. That is really – For sure. How many years before did that, did that happen b b before she was diagnosed? That was two, two years, maybe a little bit over two years. Amazing. Oh, before she – no, it was like – this was like um, a couple of months after this event. Wow. That, that happened that then was, it was a couple of months till the diagnosis, but then she yeah. lived for almost two more years. Almost two more years after that. Uh, it, and where does your dad live now? He is half and half between uh, Charlottetown PEI and Wabush Labrador. Uh, those sound like, um, don't sound like they're in the United States. <laughs> no, it's in uh, the east of Canada. Um, and, Prince and so Edward's you, Island is PEI. Uh, thank you. I thought it was where Magnum PI lived, um, and um, and you have a brother, Michael, who I've who I've met a, and spoke with a bunch, obviously, and then you have a sister. I have two sisters, one older and one younger. So it was uh, Lenora was two years older than me, myself, and then Laura was two years younger than me, and then Michael was thirteen years younger than me. Michael was not uh, planned per se. Are are you in the uh, in, are you the only one in the United States? I am the only one in the United States, yes. Wow, interesting. Have you read this book, um, uh, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse? No. No? Did you know the book? No. Isn't it the story of the Buddha? Yeah. And and so when I – when I, I, I read that book like three or four times when I was in college. Um, it was a great book. I wanted to be him so bad. And then when I, when I met you, you were kind of – you kind of reminded me a little bit of him – and that we were on similar Wait, of the uh, author or of the Buddha of the Buddha of Siddhartha. Okay. And, uh, and, and I, and, and I, and I, I, I like, I fancied, uh, I, 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 I didn't understand how you had gotten married and had kids already, but it also been like Siddhartha. Siddhartha had had a kid, but just, you know, just left the Buddha just in, in that story. He did, he didn't stay with his kid because he had more important things to do to find the meaning of life. Mm. And um, as I searched through the, the – the, I didn't expect this at all. As I was looking through your Instagram, the thing that I found the most um, enticing and the thing that I stopped at was all the books you read. Mm -hmm. Man, you read a lot of books. Yeah. Holy holy cow. And the, the, in, two, in 2018, you read a book by Michael Singer called The Untethered Soul. Mm -hmm. And – I, I couldn't tell from your write up in there, um, uh, and, and you write a lot of really abstract st stuff to me that seems really abstract. Mm -hmm. Like when I read your stuff, if I, I, I like really, and even now when I talk to you, I feel like okay, I better latch on to at least one thing and then dig in and ask what he means by that. Because I've, just, yeah. I, I do have to be honest, I do have. Um, you, pr I feel like you present ideas that are really big, and maybe I can't hold them, so I need an. Uh, analogies or i need concrete like things to grab onto yeah. but when but i saw you read, i'm reading that book right now untethered soul yeah and check this out the reason why i'm reading it is because i was on ben i'm having ben bergeron next week on next week or maybe the week after i can't remember and i've had him on before mm -hmm. and um we, we have a we have a uh weird relationship too i think it's, it's weird I, I but i really enjoy weird and um and he, as I was passing through his Instagram, he recommended that book, Untethered Soul. Yeah. He said, these are the 10 books I've read recently. And someone goes, what's the best one? And he goes, Untethered Soul. So, of course, I just grabbed it and started reading. I'm like, holy shit, this book's dope. This is amazing. And I don't know if this was your description of it or his. And, and, I'll, and I'll get to – I'm going to try to tie this all together. Um, the description said, this is a good book. This is a book uh, that's great at blending East, the East and West – and uh, it will f it will fall on many deaf ears if you haven't 
spent time on the illusory self. I don't know if I quoted that exactly right. Do you remember that book? Uh, not not too much. I was oh, trying fuck. to on the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can we can still dig in. Uh, yeah. He basically uh, this book know, describes. Like, Go ahead. I, I never know. I I I may have written that, and it could just been a reflection of like the things that I took from it at the time. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, and I just write it in hoping that. Uh, Obviously, it didn't work this time, but hoping it would like stick. Uh, oh, it's stuck. Like, what it what it means to me at that time, you know? Uh -huh. and, uh, oh, oh, to you, okay. Yeah, to me, you know. Um, right. And and uh, sometimes I would, you know, I I place those those things down. Uh, you're calling it abstract, you know. I would call it just hey, that's my expression of how I saw that, you know, with. And I, I always tried to, I think, um, uh, let let people let people uh, you know really think about some things, and I think that's why it may sometimes seem in your in your language abstract. I could understand that. Yeah, Savan, do you know when that book was written? Like the copyright on it, or approximately? I, Probably something in the last ten years, I would guess. Yeah, I would guess too. Yes. Because in um, 2006 and seven, I started uh, being exposed to what people call like new age spirituality. Mm -hmm. But I realized that um, maybe similarly to with uh, exercise, uh, actually modern exercise, James, is that I didn't think I could really contextualize a lot of the new age spirituality without understanding some of the classics. And by classics, I mean like Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity and in and, and, uh, Judaism that are like thousands and thousands of years old. Yeah. So I instead decided to read those things. And then afterwards, I started taking a look at some new age spirituality stuff and it put the, the context was totally different. So when I hear him say that this will fall on a lot of deaf ears, it's like you could read Untethered Soul now and find meaning from it. But I think if you have that platform or that background of understanding of like these spiritual principles have been existence and prevalent in certain parts of the world for thousands, possibly longer of years, then it's like it starts to make sense in a totally different way. Well, if I did mean that, um, that's, I'm gonna, I mean, you described it perfectly. It's a perfect description. It's a perfect description of the book. I just thought it was really insightful that you said that if um, if you hadn't have already taken a peek or you started to examine the illusory self, that some of the stuff would fall on deaf ears. And that's what it's kind of like talking to people who um, – They've never opened up a transistor radio to look inside and be like, oh, shit, there's not an orchestra in there. This shit comes from somewhere else. Like yeah. if you haven't looked inside the transistor radio and come to that realization yourself that the orchestra is actually somewhere else being beamed to the radio, then maybe like 90 percent of that book won't make any even sense to you. You won't even yeah. it'll sound like jibber jabber. Yeah, um, I'd love to be able to say that everything we've said over the past couple of minutes, um, I probably was thinking about at that particular time, because a lot of it resonates with me, but um, for sure, I, I think, you know, as a life lesson to keep, you know, trying to, to look inside and where you really feel firm and some of the things that, that you're, you know, embarking on and trying to learn. Um, I think that could have been the, the point I was trying to make in there, right? Um, just keep working on yourself, keep working on what you know, and what you know, you don't know, and keep asking questions. Do you remember the first time, you, how old you were, or what happened to you that you got a glimpse of of the road inside? Um, I think, um, uh, I think it was, and I'm just pausing for a second to, to make sure that you know I'm not fooling myself because I answered this this question numerous times and uh, it kind of just rolls out. So it could have just been the story I was telling myself, but I really think it was, I think I had an aha moment, let's call it of the, uh, when I was lying in bed um, for the second week um, after my, after my surgeries uh, on my lower leg, after I got injured. Um, because there's a, there's a couple of different things that really meant a lot to me, uh, but didn't mean anything to almost everyone else. And that was like the tournament still went on. 
you know, my family went back to Labrador. Uh, my friends moved on and started like setting their sights on university. Um, cause this was the end of the summer, you know? So I just had lots of time to reflect alone, you know, uh, to, you know, to, to like, what is the, what is this thing? I don't I didn't even know how to put words to it, but I did know a number of stuff. I know I felt distraught. I felt really depressed and I had, you know, um, an aha moment of like this, if it, you know, this is you now, it's all you. So this is what you got now. This is what you're going to deal with. What you are right now, what this is, whatever this is, that's your shit. That's your responsibility. And, you know, and on the other side of that, there's something coming up going, you're just a fucking number, right? Like you're not, you're not all that you thought made you to this point, right? Which was, you know, um, a young man growing up, you know, you have success in sport and uh, success in your society, you know, you build up this, you know, big identity, right? And then that's taken away in like, in like a half hour. And I had to deal with that. So I think I had aha moments during these periods of time of like, okay, you, you know, you know, just take consideration and, um, and uh, just open your eyes to things. And, um, and uh, probably this, you know, deep yearning for self-responsibility and individual responsibility, those things were built during that period of time. So I think that's probably when, um, when I was 18, I get injured. It was kind of like a, a very grateful, you know, aha moment to wake up fairly early and then uh, see those things, which I think carried me in two different phases, carried me through the years where I was doing thousands and thousands of consults with people you know, and learning about how to live a, a great life through my clients. But I, I had a base support, if you remember, you know, 19, 20, 21 of dealing with all these adults coming to me for health and fitness advice. And I had this like, uh, you know, they were met with someone who had this eye open, you know, no judgment, you know, um, persona, right. And I think I got that from those aha moments of of that uh, struggle that I had in that bed. And then the second phase of that was, you know, let's call it post consulting where I'm now coaching coaches and educating, you know, I have a, uh, I don't have all those stories every day to go off, right? I now have to stand firm and convicted and aware to coaches. So I'm just finishing off your, your point of like when it did happen with these two phases of my life afterwards that I've been super grateful for, which is like the first phase of like coaching a lot of humans. And now the second phase, just coaching coaches. And I think that started from that aha moment, I think, as a young, young man. For for people who don't know, I'll describe it. Um, and, you know, you feel free to jump in, Brian or James. There's this there's this world in front of us we see it with our eyes we hear it we taste it we smell it whatever and um a, a point can happen in a person's life where they maybe look behind them and they perceive something that they never knew was there i believe that that does not happen to you unless you are really ready to confront death and then when you're ready to confront death um in whatever way that looks like you get a glimpse of that door and once you get a glimpse of that door you can never forget that you saw that door and then these books like um untethered soul are people who have um taken a journey through that door and are telling you like what they saw and the comfort of it for those of us who have seen that and begun that journey i don't know if it's a healthy comfort or not is that there's so few people are so so few people who've taken the journey in um, and yet when they have taken the journey in, when you're on the other side, you're not even sure if it's real. It's, 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 um, and so you need your, the exact thing that keeps you, everyone from seeing the door, needing validation <laughs> you get from reading these things that tells you it's there. So it's, it's a bizarre um, paradox, but this guy does it in a way that's so simple and so rudimentary. It's none of that. I love all the mumbo jumbo Buddhism shit. I love that shit. Siddhartha. I love be here now. I love Eckhart Tolle. I love Ramdas. but this guy does it. in just like, 
here's the flour, here's the water, mix the two, throw in some eggs. I mean, he is just, it's just, I, I'm laughing the whole time I'm reading. I'm like, man, I would love to see him and the Buddha in a room. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was. And, and then you also read Stranger in a Strange Land. And yeah. you wrote, and you wrote, uh, and your review of that was phenomenal. And when I, I've never read sci fi in my life, and someone gave me that book and I, uh, it told me I need to listen to the audiobook, and I listen to the audiobook. I'm like, this isn't fucking sci fi. This is fucking the path to enlightenment. I had this get in the fucking sci fi section. I mean, what an insane book. Oh, that was so good. I, I took a summer. I, I had that luckily a couple of summers ago that a friend of mine had recommended. Uh, I too would uh, say that. I don't read a lot of sci-fi if that's what that's classified as. It's an instant um, sci-fi classic, James. Instant. I mean, that's like all the – that's how it's I, presented to I the world. Find, I find this out after the fact. Um, so immediately going in, I had hesitations. And anyways, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see that uh, of all the things that a number of people have been talking about in, uh, in you know, what's mythical, what is literal – what you know what 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 is symbolism what do these symbols what are these words what are these texts you know how can they make you you know think about things in a total different way um and that's what i think you know stories like that offer us that i've been since that point in time trying to get a little bit more um inside the sci-fi sometimes it's gone too extreme uh like the three body problem um as an example that's uh, a book yeah and you read it and you didn't like it, like it scared well, you or it's something, or super, uh, super complex. And now at the back end of it, based upon you know artificial intelligence and uh, the road that I went down in that, um, I, I've heard that uh, the translation over from uh, the the Chinese language that it was originally in text, it comes across in in the language that I can understand not as good. So, anyways, it's been a it's been a good foray into that area and. Uh, I kind of been um, doing a little bit more percentages of of stuff that's not you know technical for health and fitness, but definitely you know more of the stories and uh, and narratives and and learning and extracting principles from those things now. Which you know is another interesting point is that I think there's probably a point in time in someone's experience, let's say, of reading and listening that they could finally understand those points, right? And pull them out and go, oh, that's that's complementary now to how I see things, if I make mm. sense. So yep, yep. I, th I think that book was a was a wonderful, wonderful spot for me in my Stra life. Stranger in a Strange Land? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah just the, I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, because I, I took a couple of times to pause to think, I mean, you know, who comes up with that storyline? Right. I mean, how, just think about the brain power and the like creativity, you know, the immense amount of creativity to like connect all those points. Yes, that's and that's what it was. It connected knowing. everything. It connected full, everything. Yeah, full while knowing that your readers are going to be like, you know, I can't even believe that, he did that. that I have to believe it was an accident. I have to believe it was an accident. There's no way. Or you I, could believe the opposite. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Anyways, that's what I thought. Anyways, I was like, man, it changes. The stand it changes everything. Like the concept of it or the idea just changes, you know, everything of the possibility of of power and uh, and human power and what we think we're capable of and what we think we're, you know. Anyways, I just <clears throat> found yeah that you did. Wow, that is a great description of the book. It changes everything of what what you think you're capable of as a human. But it's a sci-fi book. It's not supposed to do that to me. Like what? <laughs> I know, but that's what I was saying. I think at the point of my life, it was it was pretty good. Um, the the biggest standout to me in that book was the main character, um, who's I I don't want to call him an alien, but that's how they portray him in the book. Michael, the main Michael Valentine, right? Yes. Wow. Good job. Wow. I forgot that the main character, um is trying to tell humans how lucky they are because in the entire universe, they're the only creatures that can procreate and be enlightened. And that all of the other creatures in the universe that are enlightened aren't, don't procreate. And I was just like, Oh my God, we're squandering some good shit here on planet earth. 
we're squandering some good shit. Do you remember that idea that yeah. he presented? Oh, for sure. But but he at the same time. I couldn't tell if I just remembered that because I was a pervert. But I was like, oh, my God. No. Okay, good. Okay. No, Unless you're a pervert, time. too. Yeah, at the same time, like he's, you know, he's, he leans really hard into stuff that, you know, obviously could be uncomfortable based upon a conf con a, a conformist concept of like reproduction, you know, and, uh, and family unit and et cetera, and like growing your mind. Um, where at the same time, if you notice, he sprinkles in all this stupid human garbage that, you know, you yourself are going, yeah. Exactly. Like we are, to your word, squandering this unbelievable opportunity. Um, and I think uh, uh, the, the, the lead uh, person, uh, you know, kept reflecting uh, this inspiration, you know, this inspiration to like, no, there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more and it's within your grasp. And so there gives us this gives us this sense of uh, uncertainty of our potential. That's why I really liked it, I think, too, to partner up with what you said. Um, yeah. For those of you who haven't read it, I, I read the I listened to the audio book and the guy who reads it is so good. And I've read oh, so good. I've heard so many books where the reader just ruins the book. And uh, I it, this is the reader is so good. Oh, that's good to hear. J James, are you successful? Speaking of abstract. Oh yeah. Uh, I think, uh, it's probably the, it's probably the wrong question to ask to someone who, you know, doesn't reflect on that question to myself all the time. I, I, I definitely dig into what is success a lot. Uh, what is impactful? Um, so I think for myself, um, I don't think that's for me to answer. Uh, I, you know, if you could ask it in a different way, if you can tie it into success. And Are I'm you not, happy? I'm definitely content. Um, I've had, I've had practice in trying to figure out that language, uh, over time of, you know, what is happiness and what is content? What is, what is this more recent book that I'm reading right now is, is based upon, uh, what's called imminent contentment. Um, what's the title but, of the book? Please. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on it. I'll reference okay. it. Yeah. Um, imminent. After. What was the phrase you used that was in the book? Imminent. Imminent contentment. Okay. What does that mean? Like inevitable contentment? Well, this, uh, baked in opportunity to be content. Okay. Uh, so the, you know, I, I have, like all humans, I think, the opportunity to have ups and downs. And uh, I think that I'm fairly awake to the ups and downs, I'm fairly awake to my emotions. Um, I reflect a lot on the concept of what success is. And uh, I think that uh, it would depend upon, you know, what a person's version is that's asking me is successful. Um, cause if I was to say, yeah, I'm successful, uh, I don't even know what it means. I don't even know what it means. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty content, um, to make it super simple. I mean, I, I keep saying that, um, unconsciously all the time in conversation to my coaches, I, I like, I got fucking, I got nothing to complain about <laughs> really. You know, I, I make up more shit to create drama and in narrative today than than i do have you know complaints well you're definitely the only person who did that <laughs> <laughs> touche um you know i got i got man i'm good i'm good so am i successful i don't know depends uh ask uh ask elon musk if i'm successful you know ask uh do you think ask uh, uh, if i'm successful i i i'm ask who a new coach Oh, um, I, th I'm hearing, and I'm totally making this up, but, but I am hearing it that you're not saying that I'm hearing that you are successful, but you don't want to say you're successful because you don't want to take your foot off the gas pedal. Uh, yeah, perhaps you don't want to give yourself an out. 
I think it's well. I, of course, everything you're saying is true. Yeah, also, we need yeah, to define sure. it. But 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 just without even defining it, I, I mean, just based on what, even if it's a totally different different definition of what I think success is versus you, I'm based based on your definition of successful. Are you successful? But I'm I'm hearing like fuck that. I'm not going to say I'm successful and, and take my foot off the gas pedal. Yeah, sure. Um, this I, car can no, go faster. I honestly <laughs> just get stuck in the question because I don't. I don't reflect on it myself. So it's probably going to take right. a lot more time for me to answer it. I reflect on it in regards to other areas. You know, what is success in fitness? What's success of a relationship? What's success in in exercise, et cetera? Like I can, I could at least jam a little bit more clearly on that. But success for me, I, I don't know. I, I I guess you know. I can relate to this in I'm in. Content. I'm content. I'm you know. Listen, I'm good. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of things to be grateful for, you know. A lot of things to be grateful for that I uh, uh, continue to uh, continues to amaze me. You know, you think that the gratitude shit would would stop, but no, it just it's never ending. So, what do, what do you mean? Oh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. No, I think I, I'm hearing something similar to you, Savan, and I can relate to this in one uh, particular regard. Is when I was um, high school history teacher in Texas, the students. Every year, and pretty much more often than that, they like to ask me the same question. They always ask me if I was a Christian. And I was, I was always thinking, like, if you're asking me this question, you must have some reason for wanting to know and some definition of what my response is going to mean to you. But I also knew from my own studying of Christianity that, uh, and, and, and by not just studying, I mean, like, experience and studying, I never really wanted to answer the question by saying uh, I'm a Christian because I felt like a lot what I observed was a lot of people would get to that point and then stop. And I think that might be what James is saying. Like success is a, is an ongoing thing. And if you ever get to the point where you say, yeah, I'm successful, then like the fear is, and now I'm done. Yeah. I think both of you are helping me define, you know, an answer to that question a whole lot better. So I appreciate it. No wonder I don't know shit. There, I'm, sure. de- I'm so successful. No wonder I <laughs> fucking just sit on my ass all day. Um, uh, J- James, are you Christian? I am not. You're, are you open to being Christian? I am. Yeah, me too. I'm not, but I'm open. I'm open to it too. So, so I'm just out of curiosity, how much longer are we planning to stay on with James? Uh, eight minutes. I think that um, it would be pr- prudent to answer Do it. The question that these people have been asking in the comments. Yeah, do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have James on. I'm, well, I'm gonna ask. Uh, what's her name? Sophia. There's a lady you talk to if you want to talk to James. Hold on, let me see her name. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Um, we're live, James. By the way, that's what uh, that's what um, yeah. uh, Brian's referencing. There's comments. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, take over. I'll just pick, keep picking James's brain. Uh, um, go, go. Oh yeah, no, Nick, ha- having talk, him talk back. About something these people care about instead of me. Using James I, well, for my own personal psychological, um, he's giving me helping me with my own analysis. Go ahead. They're just have been asking about the difference in methodology that you were referring to earlier. Well, quite a, it seems like quite a while now between CrossFit and, and OPEX. And I thought, if you don't mind, if I could offer an boring, example, boring, boring. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> if I could offer one example from my perspective, and then just you can say whatever you want. Tara, you have to talk to Tara, Tara, if you want to. Uh, um, anyway, my, uh, my perspective is the burpee is the best example of this from a physical perspective, because in the, in the world of CrossFit, the burpee is very f- well known and famous and most people don't like it. Um, I always tell people that it's one of the two movements you never want to lose over the course of a lifetime. Cause if you can uh, get up and down from the ground, your quality of life is probably going to be pretty poor eventually. But in the OPEX model, when I went through that, Uh, what I realized was that the burpee is actually an evolution of several other movements that people often lack the mastery of before they start doing a lot of burpees. And specifically the front leaning rest, which is kind of a plank where you shift your weight forward a little bit and then having really good quality of uh, push-ups and then the ability to um, hinge your hips while maintaining core integrity. And so then that was like totally enlightening to me, like this very, very basic movement and crossman of the burpee, get on the floor, get off the floor any way you can, do it a bunch of times, as opposed to thinking through the process of doing that, that movement of getting down and getting back up and that you can actually build up a, a more healthy and, and well-structured way in which to accomplish the task. That's what, it's like a microcosm example of, at least from the physical perspective, how I perceive the difference in methodology. 
Yeah, that's pretty darn good. Um, do you want me to go on in other areas that I think it's different? sure, sure, yeah. I mean, I know there are a ton, but that was just like I thought that would be an easy one for people to conceptualize yeah. who do burpees, you know. No, 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 that's that's fantastic. And for our time, of course, it's it's unfair. By the way, uh, Svan, I I would take you up on uh, uh, number two or number three or number four or number five, whatever. Um, but I'd much preferred if we can to all three of us just get in a room and talk over coffee. It, we'd probably have a <laughs> bunch of stuff that no one else needs to, <laughs> no one else needs to be a part of listening. Cause I think we wanted to do that today cause we haven't seen each other for a while. Um, I was, but, I was speaking in gross hyperbole. There's, there's be, between me and you from inside of here, there's nothing. Just so you know. I was just acknowledging the white elephant in the room. It's not my fucking white elephant. Just so you oh, know, I love you to yeah. death. There's nothing. Okay. okay. Oh yeah. No, and okay. it wasn't taken that way. I was just saying, okay. I was saying like, you know, it just seems yeah. like I, I would love to, I feel that too. I would love to like just have further discussion. Right. But on some things like, <laughs> you know, uh, the meaning of life and, right, uh, right, right. and what our purpose is. I mean, those yes. things probably just for three of us to chit chat on and, you know, yeah, it doesn't need to be in a, in a, in a, in a you know, public setting. But I like that. That yeah. is my favorite topic. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So, yeah, so uh, sure. burpees, burpees, burpees. For sure. Uh, and then there's the question. Sorry, Brian. Because <laughs> no, that asks for the question on that. Well, why are you interested in the meaning of life? And it goes on and on. Right. But that that's a, a, that side of our call. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a couple different viewpoints to to add to yours, Brian, is. Um, is that uh, uh, OPEX is is individualized and that means that we are approaching every situation we're hoping it's approached every situation that we give someone uh, a dose response and exercise relative to where they sit that day so it's it's not just it's not just uh to use other words scaled or you know uh you just give different things to kind of help people out in that that area it's it's you know clearly individualized and i, I would use that as a marker because um it, this goes into the area of reality what is reality you know uh crossfit is not individualized as much as much as man as much as they and everyone wants it to seem that way um it's not individualized and so i think that would be a clear one a second one i would say can you, you give me an example of that? Because I'm stuck. I'm stuck that CrossFit is individualized. Give me an example of that. You think CrossFit is individualized? Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't Fuck, judge that's me. a complete judgment. Um, oh. <laughs> guilty. I'm guilty. Yeah. Well, tell me. Tell me. Because I I do I do I think I do CrossFit in my garage and I individualize well, it for fact, myself. Well, I think so, let's go meta on that. The fact that we the fact that. We're actually asking, you know, I think it's outside, it's outside of our conversation to answer probably, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter what we think, but if you're just, maybe asking, I don't know what individualized means. Maybe I don't know what that means. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe, uh, individualized means that, you know, regardless of where you are and your capabilities and your experience, uh, we're going to give you something for exercise dose response with the correct intentions. That's just in front of that dot, dot, dot that creates autonomy in the future and a long-term progression okay. right so we don't care about 12 12 weeks of weight loss and we don't care about you fitting into a group conformed concept right of everyone okay. moving in space together with music and lights and and uh and a 20 minute uh time frame so that you know, um, and the and the definition, both side, you know, the definition of CrossFit, the fact that we can't even define it, you know, in in comparison, is is disgusting, actually. Uh, but it's it's, uh, you know, um, yeah, I can't even believe we're here. That that uh, not just from you, Savan, but the question is still asked that that CrossFit no, somehow. But but, but when. But, but when I when I clear, uh, was I clear on what individualized programs mean? No, but but the way you're describing it is I, I've never been into a CrossFit gym where there's lights, if flashing lights. I've been, I've heard the music when um, they start working out. But I've been like the we had a program at, at HQ uh, that I would see every single day, and there were like probably thirty or forty people in there, and they were of all very they were it was only for old people and obese people. 
this class. And yeah. every, like you walked in there and no two people were doing the same thing. And the coaches that's were, uh, Michelle. in my opinion, that's not CrossFit. Okay. Okay. Well, th now we're getting to something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So we, may, we just have different, I thought it was we had different definitions of individualized. We have different definitions of CrossFit, but isn't that what scaling is James? Isn't that like, um, it, isn't that always been sort of the foundation of CrossFit to scale the movements for each person? <laughs> help me, help me, buddy. I was only there 15 years. I'm not as smart as you help me, help me. No, no, no. That, do we not have enough time? Don't, yeah, we don't. Don't lay that on me. That's oh. uh, the fact. Uh, <laughs> Too late. I, I'm just, I'm sorry. My brain is broken. The fact that we're asking that question just shows 90 minutes of, he liked me for 90 minutes and I fucking stumbled. Oh no, 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 no. Darn it. Um, no, it's, it's sad because, you know, I have put a lot of effort and work into defining that difference. And it's just, obviously it's not, it's not seeped outside of my ecosystem and my, it, 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 that is true that, or at least not, it didn't seep into me. <clears throat> But I am I'm I'm very curious. Maybe we should have started the show with this. Well, I can say I can I can tell you this, James. That as you know, I I had a exposure to CrossFit for about four years before I came across OPEX, and I spent uh, a year really heavily investing in what you were teaching. Um, I think I finished the CCP in six or seven months, but I spent that whole year coaching people individually and really di diving into dissecting everything you had to say that was offered within that program. And I chose to make it to, to kind of use what I'd learned from both and make a, a, a hybrid application of that in my own coaching career. And then maybe that's disgusting for you to hear. I don't know. But I tried. I, I think that the, the one of the biggest things I took away from the OPEX was that a massive component of um, coaching in any capacity is developing a relationship with the people that you're working with. And that if you really invest in that side of it, that there's a ton of um, new avenues and possibilities open, regardless of what the name on the building is or what people think that they're doing there, is that if there's a relationship built up between coach and client, that that anything is possible. Yeah, I, you know, and the definition of goes back to a question you asked on my success, or both of you indirectly asked for my success. Um, you know, the definition of success in the fitness relationship is autonomy of that client to be able to go and do stuff on their own and so i think that's another definite you know uh which by the way is what Sevan's. that's what Sevan is doing now in his own gym and i think that's why he maybe has like the the tech not the words are maybe confused but he's applying what he's learned for 15 years working across it yeah yeah for sure and listen you know maybe maybe we all have to do a nice a view around the world in percentages of what CrossFit gyms are doing day to day. And that, I mean, I hear this all the time. So that's why I'm kind of surprised. Uh, but I guess explaining the story would make a lot more sense, you know, so I'm where you're coming from on that. But uh, that's not, you know, that's not what's happening, you know, in every one of those gyms. So, so large the vast percentage, large percentage, it's, it's a turnstile with a 60 minute class and there's shit you got to do. Right. Okay. So right. come in, come, this is the, this is the, and it's, and, and to be fair in my, in my defense, the other person that I know who the most hardcore CrossFitter I know is my mom. Um, and, and, and I have the closest relationship with her. I see her every single day and she's 77 years old and she goes to Annie Sakamoto's gym. So yeah. she has one of the best coaches in the world who, who does everything individualized for her. And yeah. she's 77. Do you know what I mean? But what you're saying is, is that basically yep. you walk into a CrossFit gym and it's like, Hey, everyone uh, run around the building. Everyone runs 400 meters, does the same thing. Then, okay, everyone put the weight on your bar, 65 pounds and go. Yeah. And if we're like, if we're, if there's any like in betweens on that, my yeah. point is that CrossFit can't claim like your mom is not doing CrossFit in my okay. definition. Okay. Your mom's doing fitness. Right. Your mom is exercising. Okay. So, you know, and I think that's probably where we need, you know, a clearing up is like, well, what is exercise? You know, right. if exercise is something you're going to do every day, that's slightly in front of you, that leads you to, for your mom, for example, to walk around really function, really high function at 95, then I don't fucking care what she's doing. But right. if we're going to try to define the exercise she's doing, we have to hold steady to the doctrine of the definition of that methodology. Constantly varied, high intensity functional movements. And if you're going to go outside of that definition, then it's not called CrossFit. 
Right. And, and, so and, 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 and in constantly very high intensity functional movement, that's performed for every individual in a progressive order that's relative to where you're starting. That wasn't in the doctrine. Right. So and, rel and, and relative to what I do. Why, we understand yeah. why it wasn't because it's fucking hard to sell. Right. You're not going to get you're not going to get tens of thousands of groups of people wanting to do that when you're like, and whoa, whoa, whoa. And your design is going to be individualized. It's like, oh, uh, no. well, I don't think that's you true. You, you had me until that point. I, from, from where I said, I don't think that was true. No, it, it wasn't. Uh, you're thinking there was more forethought. You're giving it more credit, the movement more credit than it deserves. It wasn't like that. The ball was just rolling down the hill. It wasn't designed for that. It was that. And then so it became that. Do, do you know what I mean? Like nope. Greg wasn't like, oh, he, Greg wasn't like, uh, from all the stuff that I saw, and I spent, you know, every day with him for, for fucking 10 years, um, no exaggeration. Um, he was never like, okay, I want to design this so more people could do it so it could sell faster so I could make more money. It wasn't. Oh, yeah, no, no. no oh, okay. I, I thought you were saying it was designed for that. No, 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 it was no. just, it was no, no. designed and then just, and then we're just got, got out the door. Yeah. Like, like, like COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I'm agreeing on that. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I'm agreeing Glad on I was that. able to squeeze that in. Yeah. Uh, we're current. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm saying the same thing, but I, I, I uh, and maybe I don't do CrossFit school, either because I don't do high intensity age. anymore yeah, relative I'm, to what I used to do. Do you do high intensity? I did, but not anymore. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, you know, wh yeah, what is it? Either. You I see it, it, even the conversation of intensity yeah. is like, so, it's, you're going to reach philosophical bedrock on it. You're just going right. to fucking, you know, what is that relative? It's like, oh, but we, that's what we say when we say high intensity is like, holy fuck, like let's, I can't even discuss these things with you. Like I, you I don't hear even you. have a comprehend, not you. You guys, don't, you don't even have a comprehension of what I mean by like physical performance forever and physical expression forever. And if you can't like even wrap your mind around that, I can't even talk. I can't even talk with you. So I can't even answer the question. You know, so that's where it ends up going. I wonder. I, I, we should yeah. have started on a base support of just what my beliefs would be in like the highest order version of physical expression for a lifetime. And that would have been much easier. And now we're on the back end, you know, answering a question on the differences in methodology, which takes, it takes a lot longer conversation, you know, to be fair to all of us and the person who's asking, which I appreciate. Well, yeah, okay. Well, we got to the bottom of it for me. I feel better about it. <laughs> Thank you, James. You're welcome. I didn't even have to dip into my two pages of notes. Except Not for the much. reference, that one thing. Yeah. I didn't oh, yeah. Tear, um, tear his name on. Let me see if there's anything in here that just has to be brought up to the forefront. Well, yeah, I owe you. Uh, you owe me that uh, Siddhartha. Um... Herman Hesse. Hey, do, um, do you do any of the whoopies or the trackers? Do you do any whoopies or any of that shit? <laughs> oh, it's called that now? No, oh, that's no, what no. I call it. <laughs> oh. Or do you do the, the the heart rate thing? Do you do any of those? No. Or or the eye the eye watch? No. No. Come on, man. You think my my uh, Pe Peloton commentary should give you an indication as to my schedule? But I saw I saw a post that you were wearing one of those. Um, oh man, I tried it all. I, I, oh, you, I, was, yeah. I was let's call it an early adopter to practicing all of those things. But uh, I think the uh, when you start uh, putting things or we're you know getting inside of the uh, the measurement tracking area i think it's a i think it's a dead end for people on intuition i equate it to gps in a car like uh you know it, if you get if you use it for a small amount of time in an area that you don't know it can be very helpful and you can learn from it but if you start using it over and over and over again you become unnecessarily dependent on it and then you can't do anything on your own yeah that certainly will help people get to that uh, uh, the book is called uh, "Why We Are Restless." Oh, that's the one you're reading right now. Yeah, that's the uh, by Benjamin Story. Uh, it's uh, on the modern quest for contentment. So I just oh uh, shit, I've been on a like a a little bit because I use the 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 beacon for coaches to kind of get individuals inspired on physical expression for a lifetime of these these pillars of you know great cognition great cognitive function at, you know, over a long period of time. 
and then great physical functioning. So being able to do whatever you want, you know, uh, whether that's defined at getting to the floor, getting up or whatever functions required for you, um, and that's needs to be well-defined. And then this other pillar, which is contentment. And so I, I've been using that for a long period of time as people to, <clears throat> to use as a beacon for individuals. And just so more recently, I want to really define what that means and the difference between that and the, the big, you know, decade long positive psych movement of happiness, which the more, more we've dug into, we've recognized when people go after happiness, it's a, uh, it's not always the best road. Instead, it's, uh, it's trying to go after this word called being content. Uh, w w as soon as I hear that title, why we are, why we were restless. Um, I think of this, my wife told me that one time that people lie because they're avoiding discomfort. And then of course I took that and ran with it. I'm like, holy shit. That's, that's why we do everything to that avoid discomfort. The case. Mm -hmm. That's sometimes the case. And then in that arena, then you have to say, well, are we just going to come up with shit, <clears throat> you know, to make discomfort and, oh. uh, Sometimes coming up with shit to make discomfort seems like it's worthwhile and it has utility, but in the end, it may not. I, I, um, from, from the little, uh, viewpoint that I have of you, um, I think that you're extremely successful and I think you made a lot of, um, smart decisions, but all built on a foundation of just relentless hard work. You're probably, um, one of the hardest workers probably anyone's ever met, I'm guessing, uh, and, and, and it's fun, been fun watching you, uh, do you from the, even, even though I still, even though I fucked up, I'm um, thinking CrossFit was individualized. I apologize. For <laughs> no, no, it's real. I mean, that's, that, that's, uh, it's, it's helpful for me to know again. Um, your work is never done, James. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, I got, I got a lot of work to do. Uh, thank you brother for coming on. Um, I, 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 I do like talking about the meaning of life. I do like talking about consciousness. I do. Um, it's what it is my, my subject. Um, uh, I, I want there to be just endless love in the universe and, and, and coolness amongst human beings. So thank you for letting me pry down that path with you. Yeah, of course. Brian, always good to see you at 7am. Yep. Thanks. It's good to see you. Brian.